Okay, welcome to part two of the Gold Recovery Without Incineration um, series. Uh, this video, as you'll know after part one, is about the machines that I've used for this that do actually work. And for those of you that are relatively mechanically inclined, you will probably at this point already have worked out quite a bit of it, uh, just based on the picture you're seeing right now. So, without uh, too much wasting time, let's get into it. So, as you are aware, we really want to put mixed ICs in one side and get a really fine powder out the other side. And one of the ways that this can be accomplished is by using a ball mill. So, the way a ball mill works is you've got a, a drum that tumbles. Let me turn this on for a second and you'll see it happening. We've got a drum that tumbles and that's got the chips inside it and it's also got some weights inside it that will actually um, destroy the chips. So that's, that's the basics of it. Uh, actually making this all work in practice was a little bit more interesting than that. So let's for a moment move the loose part out of the way. And I'm just going to handle the camera and we'll have a quick look at what I've done here. So we have got maximum zoom. We've got a steel frame that has just been uh, bolted, it's kind of screwed together um, out of uh, you, you know just your basic nuts and bolts and stuff like that. So there's no welding in the frame. Uh, as you can see, it's much too big, and you can also see the the location of where the rollers are is moved around a little bit because, um, well, because it, I didn't do it right the first time, and so I just, you know, this this is all still an experiment basically in progress. We've just got a basic wooden base on it and some aluminium legs to, to, to get the angle right, which we'll talk about the angle later. And um, we've got a little geared motor here that turns the whole lot. So, the the two rollers came from old treadmills. Uh, treadmill rollers are really nice because they have uh, really kind of good bearings in them because they're meant to take impact which you, you get on a treadmill so they, they can take a little bit of impact and I just happened to have two of these that were roughly the same length. They weren't actually exactly the same length so you'll see one of these bolts are on the, is on the outside and the other one's on the inside there but that, that wasn't really critical. One of them is just free, free turning and the other one, uh, the little belt turns on. There's, there's kind of, there's some teeth on the actual uh, roller there. That is where the the pulley from the treadmill fit. And um, yeah, and then what we also have down here is just a a little bearing. Let's see if I can show you there. It's just a little bearing that the um, that the bottom of the drum can run against. We have a, I think it's a. 37 millimeter diameter geared motor and I've just got uh, and one of the nice things about this motor we're kind of on the wrong side but the the shaft coming out this side let me see if I can get in there for you the shaft coming out the side is actually uh, offset from the center which means that when you use a very simple homemade uh, mounting slash tensioning system like this you can just actually rotate the motor to get a bit of tension on the belt uh, you don't want to over tension the belt, but um, you know it's just something you play with uh, until you get it right. The output speed of the motor is about 120 rpm, and then together with the together with the reduction in the belt, it just happens to work out that I do one full rotation of the big drum in about eight seconds, uh, which happens to be kind of roughly what you know it's what I'm using now. I haven't really put too much thought in it. That is just how things happen to turn out, and it's actually worked fairly well, so I haven't mucked around with it too much. Hey, uh, sorry about that. I ran out of battery on the camera there, so took a little break for a while. I think the last thing that I was mentioning there was the, um, the crossbar that I put in there to just uh, support, the, support the frame. Yeah, so that basically describes what the frame looks like. I'll show you next how I... Um, made the drum and the lid and all that kind of stuff for the drum and then after that we'll show a little bit of a video of how it turns and how it actually works but yeah it's not much point asking me where to buy specific things uh, for this frame because realistically 
the idea here is that you would just use the idea and uh, come up with your own implementation. These are all mainly just parts that I actually had sitting around the workshop, so I didn't actually have to buy anything to, to get this thing running. Uh, yeah, so I'll be back in a second and we'll have a look at um, how the drum came to be. Okay, so once you see this picture in front of you, it's probably going to be pretty obvious where my ball mill container came from. Um, I was after a steel container that had a nice rounded edge, so you can't really work with square edges because obviously the chips and powder and things are going to get stuck there and they won't actually get machined by the by the ball falling around and so yeah I thought um, what could be easier than 9 kg gas cylinders uh, I'm not sure what the American version of that is called but that's 9 kilograms so multiply by 2.2 .2, it's probably like 20 pounds or some 20 pound cylinder or something like that um, but yeah I'm fairly sure that these things exist all over the planet and the very nice thing about them is, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but in New Zealand they've only got a 10 year lifetime, which means that if you go to your scrap metal guy, they will have a ton of those, which they, um, they pretty much get for free because they don't actually pay people for them while they contain the valve. And so they're quite happy to just give you one if, you, you know, if you're in relatively good terms of them, they'll just give it to you. So yeah, um, let's have a quick chat about what I did to it in order to, to turn it from a gas cylinder into a ball mill chamber. So the first thing I did was, uh, my, I, um, let's grab this here. So the first thing you want to do is, is get all the gas out of it. You don't want to be cutting, drilling, doing anything like that, obviously, to a gas cylinder while it's still full of gas. That, you know, I feel like that shouldn't have to be said, but you know, you never know with people. So you can just open them, but you will notice that actually nothing happens because they actually have a little valve inside, which means that you actually have to push something into them in order to get the gas out of it. So one way to do that is to just unscrew the hose from your barbecue, open that, screw that into there, and whatever little bit of gases might be remaining in there will be removed. The other option is to put a flat screwdriver through that hole. See if we can see down there. There is actually, might not be very obvious, but there's actually a little screw, like a bleed screw on the side that you can unscrew that and that will also let the gas out. Once you've left it for half a day or so um, to make sure all the gas is vented out of it, the next step really is to, um, you can, at, at that point, it depends on how safe you're feeling. I actually removed the valve, which can be a little bit of a mission. I just used a big shifting spanner, or crescent, I think they, they call them sometimes, and you kind of managed to wedge it around it and just you know, turn it a little bit. But eventually, they, they will unscrew. They, they're quite tight, but you, you can get the whole valve out. And at that point, all you have is a, a steel drum that's got a hole in the top, so, so you can really go crazy and cut and weld and do whatever you like at that point. But yeah, so I, next step was I got the valve out, and then I just used a cutting disc on an angle grinder to cut this um, the metal bit off the top off, uh, so that we, so that, like basically, I knew that I was going to want to cut a, a hole into the top of this, um, so it was easier to get this thing out of the way first. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at this this drum here now. So this this I've just actually pulled off of the working machine. So um, you can see how my lid system works. I've got a, a little bit of round plastic cut from a, just an ice cream container, and then I've just got some old hard drive magnets. This is working pretty great. So just basically pull them off and we'll store them on there for now. Oops. There we go. Lid from the ice cream container. Got a bit of dust on it, but nothing serious. And so yeah, the what size hole did I cut in here? I don't know, like you know, a little bit bigger than a fist. You want to be able to put your hand in there relatively easily and um, because you are going to make some modifications to the inside of this there's actually a few modifications that need to be made to the inside so you know you can kind of judge it based on that but that's I don't know maybe that's a hundred mil like a four inch hole probably 
something like that. Really, it's not a big deal. So the way that I cut this hole is I, I use an angle grinder to make some cuts and then I use the jigsaw with a steel blade to cut around it. If I was doing it again, I'd just drill a hole and use a jigsaw straight away. Uh, just use a, you know, like a 100 mil jar or something, put it on there, mark it with a Mark it with a marker and you'll end up cutting a reasonably nice thing. And then obviously use a file or, de or a deburring tool to just get rid of the sharp edges from that. Because you're going to be putting your hands in and out. There's no need to, to chop them up immediately. Then the next step. Uh, let's keep talking about the outside first. So you remember when I showed you the frame moments ago that this thing runs in. That there's a little bearing on the bottom of the frame. The idea initially was that the, the bearing would be so positioned that this metal rim would run on the bearing, but a friend of mine pointed out that that was a bad idea because any kind of movement is going to make that fall off the track. And he also happens, happens, happens to have a uh, laser cutter handy. So we just cut two concentric discs. As you can see, they're pretty thick. That's about... A, a quarter inch or six millimeters or so thick and we, we glued them together and I, I've kind of I've kind of hammered it in there but the idea is basically just that one is inside and that now you can see where the bearing runs on there gives a, a nice flat surface so even if this thing moves around a little bit it's not going to um, fall off and get stuck or anything like that. Now the last thing is on the outside is because we're running on two flat rollers uh, the whole thing didn't work that well when um, these these gas bottles are made with a it's kind of hard to see in this light but there's a welded seam right there and that is a that's a high point so they're made out of a top bit and a bottom bit that are welded together and so I just took the grinder with a grinding disc and spent 10 or 15 minutes just grinding that relatively flat um, that hasn't seemed to cause any problems yet uh, you know, the, the, the welds obviously penetrated enough that you're not actually causing any problems there. You also not, you haven't got much pressure in there. So, um, so yeah, that's basically the modifications to the outside of this. Now, let me just get the ball out. So, as I said, this just came. This machine was literally working a few minutes ago. So, I've got a, a steel, a hardened steel ball here. This ball is 60 millimeters diameter and weighs about 800 grams. So 60 millimeter diameter is just over two inches and I have no idea what 800 grams is in pounds, but probably about two pounds or so. Um, I only have a single ball in this one. There are some future plans that I've got to expand this into a multi-ball system, but um, for right now this is actually doing the job pretty well. I'll just leave that there for a sec, try to not make it fall. Okay, now at this point I am going to need a torch, so I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so initially what, what I did was I simply threw some chips in, into the ball mill uh, together with the ball and I turned the whole thing on and it didn't work very well at all. The reason being that the chips and the ball would all just slide along the bottom the whole time, which meant that nothing was actually pounding anything else. And so what I did, I'm not sure how visible that's going to be, looks, looks okay, is I just put two uh, six millimeters, so that's quarter inch screws, um, into the side. And so there's just some nuts, on, nuts and washers on the inside. And you can see the two screw heads sitting on the outside there. They are probably about an inch apart, so they're probably about 25 or 30 millimeters or so apart. The, the distance you want them apart is just such that as the thing is turning, you want the two arms to grab your, uh, your ball and pick it up so that it can be dropped on the chips. Let's just get this thing rotated again. So that's one thing that I had to put on the inside. Now what I actually ended up doing eventually is I, I've got two sets of those. So I've got one set on there and I've got one set on the other side down on this side 180 degrees apart so for every rotation of the drum I actually get two drops of the ball onto the chips which work really well the other thing as I mentioned before is these uh, drums have a welded seam along the along the inside there and if you feel if you look at one that hasn't been modified 
you'll see that quite a lot of dust and chips and gold and stuff can get stuck inside that seam between the two bits of uh, metal. So all I did there is just use a silicon gun, siliconed up the whole the whole seam and just kind of smoothed it out with my finger. So yeah, that is pretty much. You see some chips in there from that I put in a little a while ago. They're still pretty. Um, they're still pretty big. These are the ones that we're actually going to be machining for for the part three video. So I, I literally only put them in, uh, you know, an hour or two ago. So they they haven't seen much work yet. But um, yeah, that is pretty much all that you need to know about this particular drum. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the lid back. Oh no, actually what I'll do is we'll run it open for a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just get everything out of the way. We'll put the, we won't put the ball back in yet. I'll show you, I'll show you what it looks like just running with the chips inside on the machine. And I'll, I'll, we'll talk about the angle and stuff then as well. And uh, then I'll show you what happens when you actually have the ball in there as well. Okay, so the first step here is to try and just show you what happens uh, inside the ball mill uh, with no ball in there. So what we expect to see is I, I just want to show you the way that the chips slide and you'll see why you end up needing those fingers to be the way that they are. Uh, so rather than using a piece of angle iron or something in there to grab the ball, fingers work really well because they allow the chips to slide through while they actually grab the ball. So I'm just going to turn this on. It might be a little bit noisy, um, but I'll just show you what happens, what happens there. Okay. So you see the way that the chips are sliding, there is going to be very little milling action that's actually going to turn them into powder there. So, you know, you'd need a year or two of sliding like that to actually have any effect on the chips. So, let me grab the ball. Okay. Now, the we've talked a little bit about the angle. Obviously, you want the angle that the machine runs at to, to be such that the the fingers will grab the ball and um, and pick the ball up. So it grabs the ball at six o'clock here. It's going to pick the ball up and carry it all the way up, hopefully to about nine o'clock. But the chips will slide through. So the chips will be at six o'clock, and then when the ball rolls off the fingers, it will actually crash into the chips at six o'clock before the next set of fingers grab the ball. So I'm going to turn it on now, and I'll try and show you that happening as best as can be expected here. I might do some zooming. Okay, fingers grab it. Ball falls down. Grab, fall down. I'll zoom in a little bit for you. Okay, and so you can basically see the idea there. So, this is, I think I've covered most of the bits of the ball mill system that matter to you guys. Um, as you can see, this actually took a surprisingly long amount of time to get all of this working reliably. Uh, future improvements include a direct drive type system for the drum, if, we, if, you know, if the little motor or the belt or anything wears out. Um, so, but the, the general effect will be the same. Um, another thing that I'm considering doing, which I'll probably do in the near future actually, is to try and make a similar system that has uh, more than one ball in it. So more than one of those big balls, uh, try and speed things up. And the way that I intend to do that is rather than have it work at this angle, I will have the, the drum working completely flat and have more of the fingers along the along the side of the machine so you can have a ball here and a ball right next to it there with a bunch of chips in between and um, yeah that should that should hopefully you know double the production as it is i guess one of the questions that i haven't answered is how long does it take 
to turn those chips like you see there into fine talcum powder dust and the easy answer is probably about two days about 48 hours which might seem like a very long time but you've got to keep in mind that for me um, I can I can move it out of the way somewhere in the workshop and it can just sit there and run 24 7 uh, you know 24 hours a day seven days a week I don't actually have to physically do much other than take the powder out and put some new chips in um, which is really the objective with this type of uh, gold recovery so um, yeah that's pretty much all aspects of this part of it dealt with I'll just put the lid back onto it now and move this back into its location and um, then uh, we will have a quick chat about machine number two which is has saved me a lot of time and hassle once you've got the fine powder so I'll be back soon okay so one so this is the second part of the video about part two of the precious metal recovery without incineration series and this is all about uh, getting rid of magnetic bits iron and steel and kovar and crap like that from your fine powder produced by the ball mill that I just showed you without you know, doing it the bloody hard way like removing those magnetic pins is one of the worst parts of, of the whole recovery process for me because it, it doesn't if you just use a magnet in a bucket of water it seems like there is no end to how much stuff you like it, it never ends you can just keep on pulling out more and more forever and when you do it that way I'm fairly sure you trap quite a lot of the gold in the magnetic material and you actually flush it away so this is the idea that I came up with. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, so this is a this is a successful engineer special, um, but works remarkably well as you will see in the in part three of this series where I show all of this stuff working. So what we've got here is a piece of PVC uh, tubing. Uh, this stuff is 40 millimeter inner diameter so it's a little bit under two inches probably one and three quarter inches or something like that it happens to have a, a flared edge for joining to the next piece of pipe but that's just the way that it was the reason this is about 900 millimeters long so I think that's about three foot and the reason that it's 900 millimeters long is because that's the length that I had sitting underneath the house the second part of this, and it will all start becoming very obvious to you very soon and you'll wonder why you never thought about that, is I've got a piece of galvanized mild steel, but just any piece of steel will really do. And as you will see, about every four inches along, I've got a hard drive magnet that is just, you know, they're not, they're just magnet, they're just sticking there by magnetic force and it goes all the way along and in total I've got one two three four five six seven eight nine hard drive magnets onto this and why have I got nine well because I had nine hard drive magnets and I spaced them relatively easily evenly so the idea is going to be sorry about the video not being maybe if I go up a little bit it doesn't really help much but the idea is going to be that we are going to put the, the magnets against the PVC pipe just like that and then I use some of these um, velcro cable tie things you just use rubber bands or pieces of string or anything you like really and I'm just going to secure the magnet bar to the pipe top and bottom once again you can make this as simple or as complicated as you want it to be and then what we're going to do which I might have to zoom out a little bit for this is I've just got a G clamp on my on my little table there but um, the idea is essentially what we want to do is just hold the hold the pipe upright so there's something like that it's just just kind of keeping it all hope that's still pretty obvious to you what's going on there and then um, yeah so just keep it upright we're going to use a little spirit level to just make sure we're relatively level and I'm not sure how big a difference it makes if it's not level but just it's natural to me to always level things and then I'm just going to come to the top again 
I've got a little funnel that I, th this piece of steel just happened to be this long that it sticks over the top like that. So all I do is I grab a little clamp, clamp the little funnel onto the piece of steel. And I've got this set up such that the magnets are on this side and the funnel is actually on this side. And the idea that I had with, with doing it this way is that you want to separate the magnetic stuff from the non-magnetic stuff while everything is in free fall. So, you feed the funnel relatively slowly, well, you know, fast enough but relatively slowly, and the material falls down the far side and all the magnetic stuff, um, and everything is in free fall now, so nothing is, is affecting anything else too much in the in, in, in this material, in this fine powder that's flowing down there, but you'll find um, the magnetic material will get attracted by the hard drive magnets and, and it'll move over to that side and get stuck to the, to the side of the inside of the plastic tube and the non-magnetic material will just fall straight through right to the bottom. And then what happens at the end is you just grab a hammer. This is not a hammer, but just, I, I just have a little, little hammer that I use and I just hold the thing and I tap it and basically what, that, what, what happens is all of the powder that is non-magnetic but gets caught up in the pins that are caught up on the magnets basically just falls out the bottom then and I find usually I have to run or well, I do run my powder through this twice usually so um, then once you're finished obviously with that you just get rid of the, the funnel Take your clamp off, put this over your steel catching bucket, remove your, uh, you know, hold, the, hold the, the, the magnet bar in place, but remove your uh, Velcro cable ties or tape or whatever you're using to keep those things together. And then just what you do is just simply move the magnets away and all of your uh, metallic stuff will just fall out the bottom. You can see there's not much left in there now to demonstrate, but um, yeah, I found this to be very nearly 100% successful at very quickly removing all of the magnetics. And I, I'm talking about, you know, taking a couple of minutes to remove all of the magnetic parts from like half a kilogram, like, like a pound of, of, um, of smashed, of, of dust, of smashed chips, where in the past that would have been you know, a lot of work with cold hands and a bucket of water and all that kind of stuff. It's, um, yeah, this is the way to do it. So I'm, I'm convinced that separating the magnetic stuff in dry form from the powder is a much better solution than letting it all get wet and, and potentially losing some gold when you're trying to just separate the magnetic stuff. So that was the second part of the, of the gold making machines that actually work. Um, as before, uh, hopefully this will be of some use to you guys out there. And um, yeah, the, the old Bitcoin address is there. If you make a few dollars of this, feel free to pass a dollar or so on to me. But um, yeah, uh, stay tuned. Probably in a day or three I'll be releasing the video that shows the entire process from start to finish about you know using all of these tools together with with some other bits and pieces to, uh, to recover the gold. So, I'll uh, be back later. Um, good luck with your recovery and be safe.